All right, we're going to look into Romans chapter 10 again. We're heading into an area of the scripture that's always been very close to my heart as a preacher. It speaks about the importance of preaching. It speaks about preaching as the vehicle upon which the gospel message rides. And so we'll turn again to Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 3 through 14 for context this morning. And Sorry? Oh, Miss Brent. Didn't catch it. Romans 10, the bulletin says 9 apparently. So it's 10, 3 through 14. All right. Speaking of the Jews, the Apostle Paul writes, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach? unless they are sent. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray to you this morning that you would add your Holy Spirit's power to the preaching and exegesis of this, your holy word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so he writes, for Christ is the end of the law. So I guess the law is all over. The end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now the verse represents what is in some ways the most controversial doctrine of our faith, or rather consequential doctrine of our faith. It's not controversial at all. In fact, it refers to the supremacy of Christ. It refers to the perfect righteousness of Christ. But I would ask that we enter into our understanding of this verse slowly and that we recognize that there are at least two other important points to be made about the verse. He mentions three things. First, he mentions Christ. Secondly, he mentions the law. And there's a relationship between Christ and the law that the apostle has been teaching throughout the ten chapters, really. And thirdly, he speaks about righteousness. And so when I began from verse 3, it said, For they being ignorant, he's talking about the Jews, ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Friends, that's not just true of the first century Jews. That's true of every unbeliever. That was true of everyone in this congregation who now seeks the righteousness of God and has sought it and have found it. It's true of everyone. If you don't accept God's standard of righteousness, which is the law of Moses, then you seek to establish your own, meaning you choose 
another standard, meaning you choose another God. And so it's been said that this verse notes that the law has ended. Some say, well, that's the, that's the verse that tells us that the law has ended. Its course is over. It's outlived its usefulness. Do away with it. That's called antinomianism. It's a great heresy, by the way. And so we fall into a danger that I have tried to expose since my first days in the ministry, and that is when we try to draw too stark a distinction between law and grace, as though they're mutually exclusive, as though they cancel each other out, as though they are bound by time and events rather than by faith or faithlessness. Shall I give you an example of what I'm talking about? For the law came through Moses, John wrote, and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In other words, there's two components to the gospel. Part of it was given through Moses, part of it was fulfilled in Christ, and you put them together and you have the full counsel of God on the subject. Now when Moses went up to the mountain on Sinai and came down with the law of God and the Ten Commandments in his hand, written, the Bible says, by the finger of God, when he came down and he read the commandments, the people despaired and they cried. They knew they couldn't live up to it. Well, at the time, they were sinning greatly before him. And the commandments were what? They were a lot of um, thou shalt nots, right? You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. And on this date, you got to do that. And on that date, you got to do this. And it was very specific and meticulous and very hard to follow. So in a sense, the law was a curse. It was something unable to be attained by human effort, by human power. But in another sense, it was the grace of God. The law is grace because God, who is harsh and reveals his harshness in the law, could have been silent and said nothing at all. But by his grace, he made his mind known to us. So in that sense, the law is grace. There is a sense in which Jesus coming, who unveiled the fullness of grace, did not do away with law. In fact, Jesus said, I come to give you a new commandment. Jesus gave us many commandments, so grace is tied up with law, and law is tied up with grace. They're not mutually exclusive. And we should remember that Jesus himself would never minimize the power, nor the intent, or the life expectancy of the law of Moses. We noted last week in the Sermon on the Mount, it was Jesus who used the very words of the law to distinguish between true righteousness and false righteousness. True righteousness or self-righteousness. The righteousness of Christ or the righteousness that we dream we bring onto ourselves. And so he wrote these words. The whole, you have heard it said section of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that? The you have heard it said section where Jesus said, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And then later he said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, anger is really murder. Sin is not just an outward act. It is an inward condition. Adultery is lustful thinking. It had to come from somewhere. The Savior went on to preach about swearing oaths and said that our simple yes ought to be yes and our no ought to be no. All else proceeds from evil. And so he refuses to expunge the law. He refuses to pray a eulogy over it as though it's dead and passed away. He refuses to make it of no effect. Rather, he expounds upon the inward rather than the outward nature of genuine righteousness. Jesus does the work here of a true evangelist in this great sermon. He shows his hearers two essential ideas, 
ideas with regard to laws and righteousness. The first is that the law in all ages and for all times will forever be the true standard of righteousness before God. So when you go before God, and we all go, the standard of righteousness that you have to meet is the one we already know is impossible to meet. So you can go on your own merit, if you like, and say to the Lord, see what a good boy I am. But he will judge you according to his law. So Jesus said, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle. Do you know what a jot and a tittle is? It's a little tiny swirl of the pen, the end of a Hebrew letter, that gives it its pronunciation little tiny dot. Not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is nothing, friends, but an adamant reminder that the law is here to stay. It will remain as the standard of righteousness before God in all ages and in all places. And our Savior offers us his emphatic assurance of this very thing. So that's number one. The second thing that he does in the sermon is to demonstrate to any honest, introspective person... And there are very few of those that the level of purity in the human heart with regard to true righteousness is an impossible standard to meet. No one who sees himself for what he is will be able to say that he or she has achieved such a high inward and outward divine standard as to never entertain a single thought of heinous sin. No one is able to ensure that his word is his oath, that his yes is his yes, and no is no in every circumstance. The standard of lawful righteousness is so high, so divine in nature, that no one on earth has any hope of truly reaching it, and we found out in the book of Romans that that was the whole point of the giving of the law, to show you the perfect holiness of God. James attests to this very thing. He wrote, For whoever shall keep the whole of the law and yet stumble in one point, that's that sort of jot and tittle thing. He's guilty of all. So the law is here to stay. It will remain as the standard of true righteousness and it will forever be a humanly impossible standard to reach. The great tragedy that the apostle laments is that the Jews saw themselves as righteous by their favored status in receiving the law from God. They just felt the fact that it was revealed to them gave them salvation. They were privileged. Paul didn't shy away from that fact. They were given the oracles. They were entrusted with the statutes. They were even given the prophecy of a savior that was to, co- was to come. A lot of good that did, most of them. The great tragedy that the apostle laments is that the Jews saw themselves as righteous by their favored status, status rather in receiving the law from the hand of God. They thought it was done deal. Yet they were not honest with regard to their natural ability to follow it in their day-to-day lives. They would have thought that the Pharisees were righteous. Jesus said, your your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And then he went on to show their unrighteousness. And further, they disregarded God's wrath, which was already upon them. That's amazing to me. 
If you've ever read the Old Testament from beginning to end, there is a short little span of time of 80 years when they held hegemony in the Middle East and that their enemies were at bay. Just that short 40 years of David's reign and that short 40 years of Solomon's reign, and then right after that, they went into captivity to Assyria. In Israel, that was the northern part. And then a hundred years later and a few kings later, of course, uh, Judah also followed suit. And Babylon came in and swallowed up Assyria and Israel and Judah and Egypt, for that matter. And they took the whole thing. And then later on, the Persian Empire rose up and the great Persian Empire swallowed the whole thing. And as you follow through, you come to a place where the, the Persians and the Jews had really a pretty good relationship. Like in the time of Ahasuerus... And Artaxerxes, when you talk about the books of Nehemiah and Ezra and Esther. And Cyrus, the great king, allowed Zerubbabel to go back and rebuild the temple. But still, they were not a free nation. They were not a powerful nation. They couldn't keep an army. And then after that, the Greeks came in. And the empire, when the empire of Alexander fizzled out over the silent years, those intertestamental years, those 450 or so years, Rome came in and conquered all and ruled all, and they were under Roman power at the time. And to this day, Israel was left with nothing of their former glory. They had a mere 80 years of glorious hegemony. And that was due only to the protective hand of God upon them that was soon to expire, and it did expire. When Jesus came upon the scene, he preached to the Jews that the truth will set you free, yet in their insufferable blindness, they retorted, we are Abraham's descendants, we have never been in bondage to anyone. Did you read the book, or did you just see the movie? How can you say you will be made free? All the time they were complaining about taxes to Caesar. You may remember very famously, right? They complained about Caesar's ensigns, his banners, his standards in the holy city. And they say, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. You've almost never not been in bondage to anyone. And they are a symbol of humanity being in bondage to sin. At the time of that statement, they had been in ceaseless bondage to pagan empires for a thousand years. But Christ did come. He came as our representative to live a perfect life before our eyes. We know what it's like to live a perfect life. Some people say that's the gospel. Jesus came and he was just a good example. Too bad he died. Too bad he was persecuted and he was innocent, but they said he was guilty and they killed him too bad. But he came, he was a good example. Friends, that is not the gospel. Jesus didn't come to just to be a good example. He came to die on the cross. It was his intent. In order to truly be our representative, he had to come in the flesh. And so the incarnation becomes an indispensable step In the process of freeing those captive to their own sin, the prophets talked about the incarnation. They talked about that virgins shall have a son, and they missed it. Our gospel makes it clear that our righteous Savior bled and died on a cross of torture, and that he did it for our sakes. This holy, pure, righteous, and perfect man became our substitute. The Lamb of God gave his life for our sins. The perfect, sinless, innocent Lamb was slain for our transgressions. He paid the price for the sins of those who would not, or rather who would believe, and for them exclusively. I'm going to say it again. He paid the price for the sins of those who would believe, and for them exclusively. And he said so in his high priestly prayer in the Gospel of John chapter 17. 
I do not pray for these only, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. And as we know, he already picked them and knew who they were. Now, how do we know that the price on the cross was adequate? How do we know God accepted it? The resurrection. The resurrection is the proof. God accepted it. That in the divine economy of God in heaven, death could not hold an innocent man. You know, if you never sinned, you would not die. Sin is the rec- death is the recompense for sinners. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Death could not hold them. It is implicit in so many of our cherished verses, that one from Ezekiel 18. The soul that sinneth, it shall die which clearly implies the soul free from sin shall not die. More explicitly, though, our gospel tells us, God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Death could not hold him. Because he fulfilled the law. What he did by works, we do by faith. Death is for the guilty, friends, but the righteous go free. So our verse tells us Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Regard the word end here as goal, and you'll do better with the verse. Christ is the goal of the law. He did not come to abolish, but to fulfill it in all its demands. The law is intended to display perfect righteousness in those, quote, brave enough or foolish enough to try to reach it unaided by Christ will be judged by the law. Isn't it a tragedy? This is what Paul's lamenting. Salvation is before you. It's nigh thee, he said, even in your mouth, even in your hand. And people will go it alone instead and face the yawning jaws of hell by themselves. But for the humble, for those who have surrendered to the dictates of the law, seeing the sheer human impossibility of fulfilling its demands, they will be judged by Christ's relationship to the law and not their own, praise God. That's the essence of the verse. So for them, friends, for the faithful, it is finished, the law is finished as a tax master. It has no more power over us. Christ has stripped it of its condemnation power. Paul wrote of it to the churches of Galatia. He said, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. And it did that. I like the older version. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. He goes on to say, but after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We can no longer be judged by the law. Praise God. We already know we can't measure up. By faith, our relationship to the righteous standard is changed. Not only are we given power by the Holy Spirit to obey the law in its righteous demands, but its dictates are written on our hearts. We delight in the law of God as the faithful old Psalmist delighted in it. The psalmist sang in celebration of it. Psalm 1, we read, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. For the faithful, friends, the law is a delight. From Psalm 119, we read, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Paul reiterates these sentiments in his epistle from chapter 7. We read, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. You remember that exchange. I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. And then he confesses that his outward man, his flesh, has no power to resist sin of itself. 
So our verse is for the saved, for those who look forward to the Messiah by faith, and for us who look back to his appearing. That's us. We look back to his appearing. It happened thousands of years ago. And those before his appearing looked forward to his appearing, but it's the same faith in the same Lord. He's either expected or he's already received. We're not expecting him. <laughs> well, except in regards to the second coming. But both are by faith, friends, and neither are contrary to his righteous demands. Our gospel expressly states that it's for those who believe, but our next verse is for those who do not believe. It's for those intent on going it alone. Friends, don't go it alone. Because I don't want to be up here lamenting you the way Paul's lamenting the Jews. They had it before them and didn't treasure it. It's for those, this verse is for those too stubborn and too blind to see their own moral impotence. I said last week it's for those to whom pride has had its way. You know they talk about pride parade, parades today. Well named. You know, I was thinking, as I said to you, we ought to have a humility parade. But like I said, I don't know if you can do that. Humility doesn't parade itself, but I thought of a way to do it. Here's what you do. You get the churches together, and you make signs like, all have sinned. Or, or as David said in the psalm, I am a worm and no man. Right? You come out with these, you come out with these humility signs, and we'll have this parade, and we'll all tape our mouths and walk with our signs with our heads down. We'll have a great humility parade and everyone will come out and have a really bad time. I can't believe our culture celebrates the kind of things they do. Isn't it amazing that the whole homosexual, transsexual caucus has co-opted the word pride? You don't say gay, but we used to say gay pride. It's just pride now. Pride means homosexual. Now, the church has to separate itself from these ideas, and we can't just be silent on it. Our gospel expressly states that it's for those who believe. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, it says. In other words, we receive by faith what Christ accomplished by works. Indeed, friends, it is finished. Verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. In another of this apostles, this is rather another of Paul's paraphrases of Moses. He takes great liberties with the Old Testament. So did Jesus. So from Le Leviticus we read this. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgment, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. So you see, Paul is quoting or paraphrasing from Leviticus 18.5 in verse 5 of chapter 10 of Romans. In other words, those who live up to the righteous standard of the law will live. You will live by them is what he means, you see. Our gospel tells us two things. For us... It is an impossible task to reach such an impossible standard. And two, there was another who reached it for us. That's the gospel. Pastor Ken used to tell a story. He'd say it often. Someone came up to him and said, Pastor Ken, do good people go to heaven? And Ken said, yes, they do. Trouble is, there are no good people. That's our, that's our doctrine. We're not good in and of ourselves. We're good if God declares us so. And only through Christ can we be called good. Remember the rich young ruler came out, said, good teacher, and Jesus said, no one is good, but why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone. In, in other words, am I God or not? By faith in Christ, our journey is over, friends. We're, we're just waiting for the reception ceremony. That's all I'm waiting for. It's already over. It's a done deal. We're assured of our salvation. Nothing in heaven and earth, neither height nor depth nor any other created thing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Let's not forget the rest of the series. By faith in Christ, our journey is over, but for the reception ceremony when the Lord receives those for whom he died, 
those who took up their cross daily and walked with him, and you hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So our journey is over. It's come to an end. Its righteous requirement has been met. The blood has been displayed. The high priest's hands have been raised for all to see with the blood of the lamb on them. The innocent lamb lay dead upon the altar when Caiaphas claimed it is finished. Did you know that the high priest of Israel claimed it is finished when he killed the Passover lamb? Sadly for the high priest and his ilk, they only saw the symbol of Christ in the lamb. They never saw the substance. They never saw the substance because in their pride and in their anger, they crucified the substance outside the city as to not defile themselves with the likes of him. Where the true lamb of God was on the real altar of God and the real blood was spilt and it was really finished. Not inside the city, but outside, according to the ancient schedule, according to the ancient appointment prophesied by men of God for century upon century. And so the long memory of the Lord was fulfilled and all the promises with it. And so Paul wrote of this very thing, saying in this epistle, for what the law could not do, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. What the law could not do, God did. There will never be a verse that will say what the law could not do, you did. What the law could not do, God did, by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. He didn't come in the likeness of the flesh, he came in the actual flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looked like any other sinner. He goes on to say that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verses 6 and 7 says this, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Have you ever thought about these verses? Are they confusing? I wondered about these verses for a long time, but I had to meditate on them all week till I came to some conclusions about them. And the secret to understanding these verses is to understanding, once again, that he's paraphrasing Moses. Faith says, do not say who will ascend into heaven. Faith says, do not say who will descend into the, abyss. into the abyss, he's saying. Faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend. Faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will descend into hell and bring Christ up. Once again, he's paraphrasing Moses. And so we read from Deuteronomy... For the commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it afar off. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us and bring, us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. So you see what he's saying. Paul's, of course, changing the words a little bit. So Moses prefigures the gospel of Christ by saying this very thing that Paul has been teaching to his Jewish compatriots. He writes this. Moses writes this in verse 30. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, 
and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. So you see what Moses is doing here? Do you see what Paul is doing here? This is the essential nature of preaching. It's not about improving your intellect. The gospel is never simply an intellectual exercise. It always comes with application. It's always about the application. It's about knowing your part. It's about recognizing that the work that's been done by another, the dictates of which are put into practice by faithful hearers. This is why in the next verse, Paul goes on this celebration of preaching and of hearing the word as the one vehicle for, sal for salvation. And so he writes, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? Friends, the preacher preaches. The word does its work. You do not need to ascend into heaven and go on some great pilgrimage. This is what he's talking about. Remember what Moses said, you don't need to sail the seven seas to find righteousness. You don't need to descend into hell to put yourself through all sorts of quests and trials as the knights of old did in their prideful delusions. There's no holy grail that you'll find greater than the treasure that the gospel preacher unveils to you. You do not need to deprive yourself of food or sleep or material comfort as did the monks of old who thought that they could ascend into heaven by their own righteousness or descend into hell by their self-imposed trials. You don't need to do all these things, and they didn't have to do them. So what did these deluded saints have to do? They had to hear the word preached. They had to be present when the word was preached. They had to hear it. They had to surrender to it. To surrender isn't to do something, it's to do nothing. There was nothing for them to do but be near it. It is near thee, the preacher said. It's even in your mouth. Moses preached it. Paul preached it. I'm preaching it. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the gospel is preached. And so the apostle asks, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So the word is near you, beloved. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. There's no great quest or voyage to retrieve it. We'll find the Holy Grail. We'll drink from it and be healed. We'll pour it out and heal the land. Friends, Christ is the Grail. The Gospel is the drink. There are no great Herculean labors to perform. No giants to slay, no armies to conquer. It's near you, it's in your ears, it's in your mouth, it's in your hearts. The work has already been accomplished by someone else. You just have to surrender to it. After the crucifixion of Christ, how can you suppose that some other labor some other test of, quote, courage or greatness or goodness, and yes, I'm doing the quotation marks, as, um, as hard as that is to watch. But um, if you do, it, it, you, can you really believe there's some other test of, of courage or goodness or greatness than Christ on the cross? Is there something we need to add to that? The Roman Catholic Church says, yes, you will add a lot to it. There was in all eternity but one thing, one labor, one man, one sacrifice that was seen as great in the eyes of God the Father, and that was Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was the one work that impressed God. Nothing impresses God that you do. You can't make him love you more than he does, and you can't make him love you less than he does. Your works in the final, in, in, the, in a salvific sense, do not matter. They don't change the situation. The apostle said the same thing to the Corinthians. He wrote it this way. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring in you the testimony of God. For I determined 
not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You do not need to ascend into heaven to bring Christ down. Nor do you need to descend into hell to bring him up. <coughs> there is no test of greatness for the believer. There is no script <coughs> to memorize. There is no song to harmonize. There is nothing but the blood of Christ. There are no works to merit him. There's nothing in this world to draw him. There's no pedigree to him impress him. There's nothing in this world that impresses him but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul wrote to the Philippians, beware of dogs. And when he says that, you know he doesn't mean dogs. Beware of evil workers. That's the same as beware of dogs. Beware of the mutilation. That's the Judaizers. The Judaizers who would come in and make you be circumcised to make you right with God. Beware of them. For we are the circumcision. Remember he said we are the Israel of God. Now he says we are the circumcision. Who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. He's telling you your Jewishness, no matter how great your pedigree is, will not impress God. Only surrendering in faith to Christ impresses God. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. But I count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that is from God by faith. He could have said, I have lost all things, oh poor me, but he didn't say that. He said, having Christ more than makes up for everything I suffered, having Christ makes up more for, than everything I lost. And to the Galatians he said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And so, I will preach the same ancient gospel message. People are always trying to improve the gospel, and that's on the church. The church always wants to fix it. They want to take the harshness out of it. But then it's not the gospel, is it? There's a broad road and a narrow road, and only one, needs, only one leads to life. And when I do a series on Matthew, I'm going to tell you which one that is, because I know you're all wondering. So I'm going to preach the same ancient gospel message that Moses preached, that Paul preached, that the apostles and the Puritans and the reformers preached. It's near thee, beloved. It's even in your mouth and in your heart. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to enlighten us. By this, the proclamation of your holy word, O Lord. Add your spiritual teaching to these things that we hear in our ears. Let them settle down into our hearts that we might be nourished by the pure milk of the word. We pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.